Hi, I'm Tony Gondola from the Mexico Museum of Space History, welcoming you to the next edition of Stories from Space. Enjoy! On the western side of the Rocket Park at the New Mexico Museum of Space History in Alamogordo sits a silent icon to the space race of the 1960s, the Rocketdyne F-1 engine. Even before John F. Kennedy became the president and committed the United States to the moon race, NASA well understood that the future projects would need an engine much more powerful than anything designed and flown before. The original concept for such a powerful engine was contracted to Rocketdyne by the Air Force in 1955, but the project was eventually dropped due to a lack of Air Force applications. The contract was picked up by NASA in 1959. The final product of this contract was the astounding F-1. There are many rocket engines on display at the museum, but none more impressive. The F-1 stands 19 feet tall and is 12.3 feet in diameter at the base of the nozzle extension. It weighs in at 18,416 pounds. The engine consumes while operating 670 gallons of fuel and oxidizer every second, developing 1.5 million pounds of thrust at sea level. It was, and still is, the most powerful liquid fuel single combustion chamber engine ever designed and flown. This engine was not only powerful, but reliable. Qualified for manned flight in 1966, the engine had a reliability rating of 99.78 as of April 1971, a remarkable achievement for the time. Five of these incredible engines were used to power the first stage of the Saturn V rocket, generating a total of 7.5 million pounds of thrust. That's the kind of power that it took to get a six and a half million pound vehicle off the pad and on its way to the moon. Now that we know a little bit about the history and capabilities of this engine, let's take a closer look. If you stand between the nozzle extension and the main engine, you can look directly into the heart of the machine, from the primary nozzle right up into the combustion chamber. The first thing you'll notice is that the entire surface is completely lined with tubes and they serve a very critical function. When the engine is running, temperatures inside the combustion chamber can reach well over 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Without additional cooling, the engine would simply melt in a few seconds. To prevent this, 70% of the kerosene fuel is diverted through those tubes before entering the combustion chamber to be burned, effectively carrying away the excess heat and keeping the structure cool. As we look deeper into the engine, we can see a round plate covered with hundreds of small holes. That's the injector plate. Think of it as a huge shower head that sprays the kerosene fuel and liquid oxygen oxidizer into the combustion chamber to be burned. You'll also notice raised dams consisting of a small and large circle with radiating spikes. In the early days of the F1 engine development, the engineers were plagued with something called combustion instability. The combustion chamber is so large that when the engine started, shock waves would develop and increase in intensity until the engine was torn apart. Since there was no way to prevent the formation of the shock waves in an engine this large, the dams were there to break them up before they could cause any damage. As we move to the outside of the engine, we're faced with what looks like a plumber's nightmare. So let's make some sense of it. Note the large structure at the top of the engine. From right to left, we have the turbo pump, gas generator, heat exchanger, and gas generator exhaust manifold. The gas generator burns a fuel-rich mix of liquid oxygen and kerosene. The gas that's created spins the turbine at over 5,000 RPM, creating 52,000 horsepower in the process. This is the power that forces the fuel and oxidizer into the engine through the injector plate that we saw earlier. The exhaust from the gas generator then goes through the heat exchanger section where it heats helium and oxygen gas. That's used to maintain high pressure in the fuel tanks and oxidizer tanks during flight. After all that, the relatively cool exhaust gas enters the exhaust manifold that wraps around the bottom of the primary engine nozzle. Remember all those tubes carrying fuel to cool the inside of the engine? Well, those only extend to the bottom of the primary nozzle. The nozzle extension, shown here, also needs protection from the hot expanding exhaust gases, and that's where the cool gas generator exhaust comes in. It's injected into the wall of the nozzle extension, forming a film of cool gas that protects the structure. 
In this slow motion view of a Saturn V leaving the pad, note that when the exhaust first leaves the bottom of the engine, it's black. That's the layer of sooty cooling gas doing its job. While we're looking at the side of the engine, notice the beefy four-legged structures. These were the gimbal mounts. Hydraulic rams were attached to the tops of these supports, giving the control system the ability to slightly change the direction of the engine as it was firing in flight. Much like balancing a pencil on the end of your finger, most rockets need this kind of active control for stability. The flight computer would gimbal the four outer engines of the Saturn V first stage to keep the rocket stable and on the proper flight path. Looking at the very back of the engine, you can also see the large gimbal bearing that allows this movement. This ball and socket joint allowed the engine to move up to six degrees in any direction. The large structure to which the gimbal bearing is attached is the liquid oxygen manifold, and below that is the manifold for the kerosene fuel. You can follow the large oxygen and fuel lines as they travel down from the turbo pump through the main valves to the manifold inlets and then on into the injector plate. The rest of what you see are hydraulic, electrical, pressure feed, and sensor lines for various functions of the engine. Unlike a modern rocket engine like the Space Shuttle SSME that uses precise computer control for operation, once the start command is given and the igniters in the gas generators start burning, the engine manages most of its own startup sequence to main stage by using rising fuel and hydraulic pressures along with a few sensors to manage the sequence. Shutting down the engine is even simpler. Simply close two fuel and two oxidizer valves and the engine stops thrusting in less than a second. As the Apollo program became operational, Rocketdyne was already looking at future versions of the engine that would be lower in cost, higher in thrust, and also had the ability to be throttled. Alas, it was not to be, as interest and funding in the program waned and the Apollo flights 18, 19, and 20 were canceled, so was any further development of the F-1 engine, freezing it in time as a testimony to the skills and ingenuity of the people who designed, built, and tested this amazing machine. Well, that wraps up our latest edition of Stories from Space. I hope you enjoyed it. Please be sure to check this location for future updates and information. And for now, stay home, stay safe, and stay curious. <laughs>